Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the CSM Practice Podcast, where we interview interesting people about their perception on customer success and best practices and what worked for them to keep customers for longer and even expand wallet share. And a lot of times, as you know, I'm interviewing customer success professionals, but today I have a very special guest because he's actually a CEO of a very fast growing company that helped a lot of other companies grow and scale with what we call an EOS operating system for companies, essentially. Mark Abbott, CEO of 90.io, which is an application that helps companies establish and formulate their operating system and their EOS system into uh, something that's solid and more formal and more structured is here to tell you not only about his perception around customer success, because I think as a customer success professional, you kind of want to understand how CEOs think about it, but he's also going to share how he leveraged EOS to help retain more customers to help amplify and structure customer success and scale that organization. And so I think you're going to get two things out of this interview. One, how do CEOs think about customer success? And two, how can you leverage EOS to help yourselves amplify customer success in your own organization and why it's such a game changer? And so with that, Mark Abbott, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Reed. Awesome to be here. Great to see you. You've been a CEO, not for the first time. Can you tell me a little bit about how did you become a visionary CEO for startup companies? What drives you? What's your philosophy? Early in my career, I found myself thinking that the businesses that I worked for could be a heck of a lot better than they were. So part of my personality is I tend to connect dots and question things. And I enjoy doing that. Real early on in my 20s, first started by working out bad loans, which are loans to commercial companies that were not going to get paid back in total. And that sort of set me down on this journey, trying to understand what makes a good company. Around 2005, when I was a senior partner in a private equity firm, I just felt like there was an opportunity to write a book and create software that sort of made the fundamentals of turning an idea into an enduring company relatively simple. You know, I got to the point in my career, sitting on a bunch of boards, investing in companies where I felt confident I had identified all the tools and the disciplines that you needed in order to turn an idea into an enduring company. While I was sort of pursuing that vision, one of the companies that I invested in personally was starting to run on this thing called EOS. So the entrepreneurial operating system, and I discovered the book Traction. And I was like, hey, that's my book. But the truth is it was written better than I would have written it. I met Gino and I shared with him my vision for building software. And he was like, that's not a thing that we're in our DNA. So if you want to go do that and, and support the community of coaches that he was building and their clients, then it was cool by him. That's the story. We didn't launch 90 until many years later. So we launched 90 and, and 16. That's kind of the background story. Obviously, you have so much experience working with companies. And just like you said, what makes company work well? What makes a business into a high growth companies, organizations? And I wanted to ask you how much customer success in your preview as a CEO plays a role in making a company a real business. It's everything. When you come up with an idea for a business, there are a couple of different approaches that people tend to take. Some of them focus on product and some of them focus on a problem and a particular market. I'm highly biased towards focusing on problems that are going to almost be forever and markets that are going to be forever. The game is to develop high trust relationship in that market. And obviously to do that, you need to figure out who you're chatting with or who your ICP or your ideal customer prospect or, or your ideal customer persona, and then develop a high trust relationship with that persona. At 90, we help simplify the hard work of building a great company and our ICP is what I like to refer to as an ambitious founder. And then we focus on the founders who've gotten their companies to at least 10 employees and, 
and we start to become less focused when the companies get over 250 for right now, because you need to be able to sort of nail your value proposition. You need to be able to nail your positioning. You need to be able to nail what it takes to develop a high trust relationship with your customers. The wider that ICP is, the harder it is for you to become like amazing at developing and maintaining a high trust relationship with that ICP. So we're focused on companies that have 10 to 250. We're focused on ambitious founders. And the reason that we're focused on ambitious founders is crazy ones who want to turn an idea into a company. Well, as a CEO of a high growth company right now, how much do you place customer success as a criteria or a factor for you to get to the goals that you put for your company in the next three to five years? Is this a critical component? Yes or no? Yeah. Well, so I have a slightly different take on the bigger question here. So I believe that you need to develop high trust relationships with all of your ideal stakeholders, but not just your customers, but your employees and your partners and in your investors. And so for me, our focus is building high trust relationships. We don't say customers are more important than our employees or employees are more important than our customers and all that kind of stuff. It's about trust. So what's trust? Trust is character, it's competency, it's connection. Competency is you say, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to deliver. This is what you should expect from us in terms of the very nature of the product and the service that's associated with the product. You want to deliver on that thing. We focus very much on a high trust relationship, number one. Number two, from day one in the company, my perspective has always been, we've got to do everything we can to develop a high trust relationship with our customers. And so that means that there are parts of the organization where you have a budget. The only part of our organization that in theory had an unlimited budget was customer service from day one. And the big idea there was if we don't have high trust relationship with the customer, we're dead. We've always just said, look, what do we need to do in order to meet what we think is the standards that we should have with regard to customer support and customer service? So as an example, since day one, we've had real humans dealing with customers as soon as they hit chat. And we've tried to always have the response time be within five minutes. Today, we're 24 seven real humans with supporting our customer base uh, five days a week and then 10 or 12 hours on Saturdays and Sundays. And ultimately we want to get to 24 seven. They know you care and they see that you care and they know that you're focused on building a high trust relationship. You can build up a lot of uh, goodwill. How as a CEO, do you distinct between a customer support team and a customer success team. And I know your company is not pure PLG, product led growth, but it's a low ticket item, relatively speaking to some other companies that might be selling every deal for a million dollars or more. Do you distinct between the roles? Do you think we should distinct between the roles? What's your perception on that based on your experience? Our PLG, we don't have as a sales force. I think the reason why maybe you think that we're kind of quasi PLG is that we do have almost a thousand coaches around the world who have their clients get up and running on 90 thousand coaches around the world. They bring probably 30% of our customers, but the rest is there's no sales force. We don't sell, we serve. And so in terms of how we have structured client success, there is an onboarding team, then there is regular, I'll call it chat support. And then for the larger clients, we do have dedicated relationship managers on client success side. There's no inbound sales or anything like that. Okay. So they do the onboarding and you also talk about maintaining goodwill. Mm -hmm. How do you approach that? Is that a proactive engagement model? Or is that more reactive in a sense that because it's PLG, we're waiting for the customer when there's a break fix, we're going to fix it. What worked for you so far? Right now we have more of a proactive relationship management motion for the larger customers. And then we have the relationship managers dedicated there. 
And then for the vast, vast majority of our clients, because the vast majority of them are probably between 10 and 75 employees, for the vast majority of them, we're just there ready to help whenever we can. We're pretty good at within five minutes of them asking for help. We're there. As you know, there's a lot going on these days in terms of leveraging AI to get instantaneous answers to questions. And I think 65% of all inquiries were being immediately handled by our chatbot. So I think we should be able to get to 80% plus, and then we can bring the size of companies that we're proactively supporting. You can bring that size down from wherever it is right now, 250 plus employees to who knows where it'll get to over time. And who knows where the AI will get to being very, very good at hitting level one and level two sort of needs. I think time will tell, and I definitely think it's one of the most predominant ways that companies can embrace AI to increase customer experience. And by default, also, if it's done well, they can maintain that goodwill fairly quickly because nobody wants to be on the phone with somebody if they could just press a button, get the answer quickly and get back to their day fairly quickly. I did want to ask you, you know, with regards to your higher touch customers, where you do have proactive customer success, there's a buzz around the industry right now. We're recording this mid-2024 of companies completely dismantling the customer success organization and just calling it a day. Do you think that that's the right way? Do you even understand why they're doing that? And then if that's not the case for you, how do you know that your customer success team is highly performing, what kind of KPIs do you hold them accountable for? So KPIs, we're always working on figuring out what the best KPIs are. Once again, not to be a cop out here, but we now have 12 departments. Our customer success organization's pretty darn good. And so I can't tell you all the KPIs that they're using these days. I do know that we have CSAT scores. I do know that we have response times. I do know that we have data on how each of our reps are doing, how they get scored in terms of just providing great customer service. I do know that there's other KPIs that the team is monitoring and we have targets that help us make sure that there's no real issues going on. As a CEO, what metrics do you care about as it comes to post-sales? We do NPS, but I was thinking more of the likes of G2 and Captera, And I always watch those scores and you know we're pretty much 4.5 out of 5. We do not play any games there. We watch that obviously all the time. We use Slack and every single day I watch and read, I should say. All the feedback that we get, we get customer suggestion feedback and we get customer satisfaction feedback. I read that every single day. For me personally, I'm in touch with what's being shared every single day. I will add to the Slack, I agree with them, or hey, let's double down on this or blah, blah, blah. I think we've got a decent sense for our relationship. I think we've developed high trust relationships with the vast majority of our customers. They know we listen. They see that we're updating things like constantly. And so they'll say, oh, wow, I asked for that. And now I got it kind of a thing. Product reviews, product feedback, enhancement requests, like sentiment, which mm -hmm. you're not necessarily taking from NPS surveys only, but you're actually putting a real close eye on the online reviews. I think that's great as a CEO, you're so in touch with the end users and you go and you meet with them face to face and have actual conversations. We leverage Gainsight. I think we have a, a decent sense for things. And one metric that I was expecting you to, that would just fly out of your mouth, but maybe it's a PLG thing, is that you're very concerned and very interested in watching and monitoring gross retention mm -hmm. and upsell revenues. But maybe because I framed the questions around KPIs for customer success, mm -hmm. it almost between the lines, if I had to read it, you don't believe that those are customer success metrics. You think that these are metrics for the entire company, potentially. Net revenue retention, that's one of our most important numbers. That and obviously revenue growth, and that's really ARR and MRR growth, our big numbers, the number of paying users, number of paying companies, average number of paying users per company, penetration rate. Those are all things, trust me, that we focus on. But do you hold customer success accountable for, or do you think that in a PLG model, 
everyone has a piece of that cake. And I'm just thinking, reflecting on what you said earlier in the conversation. Yeah. I, every I, department in the company is responsible for establishing trust quickly and maintaining the trust with the client. I think every single person in the company who's been here for at least 90 days has a very strong sense that job number one is creating high trust relationships with all of our stakeholders. People hear about that every single week. We have all hands every two weeks. We talk about core values. We talk about trust all the time in those things. We do the state quarterly state of the company. We talk about that all the time. Onboarding new employees. We're talking about it all the time. So part of it is that thing. Part of it is that I tend to look at marketing, onboarding and expansion is more in marketing's hands than it is in customer success hands. Because the nature of our business is PLG-ish, the vast majority of our customers are small and mid-sized businesses. You're talking about the average revenue per month is 15 times 16. I mean, it's just not a big number. So you're talking 200 and something dollars a month. You can't allocate it'd be a, the red. Yeah. You'd be in the red if you did high touch. You got to figure so it out. Yeah. So you're doing digital CS and you do it through marketing because they have all the right skill set and all the right talent to make that happen. Yeah. Now they're working hand in hand. We are a company that's, you know, we eat our own cooking. One of the things that we do is we set rocks every single quarter. We've got a large senior leadership team, but we have 60 rocks for this upcoming quarter. And then every single department has a bunch of rocks and every single team has a bunch of rocks. And so we probably have 400 rocks every single quarter that across the company that we're working on taking things to that next level. And I would tell you that a lot of those are cross-functional efforts and we call them tiger teams. So we got tiger teams dedicated to cross-functional efforts. And one of the tiger teams that we have this quarter is an expansion tiger team. There's probably a rock around onboarding and expansion every single quarter. I speak to a lot of customer success executives and it sounds like in your company, there's a strong culture around cross-functional collaboration. And I know it's not just because you're using your own system 90 and maybe you can share a little bit what goes with it to establish such a culture because i can tell you for a fact there's a lot of companies where cross-functional collaboration while is expected is not as strong there's a lot of siloism maybe you kind of share you know if you were a ceo and you were looking at your company and you know it's siloed and the cross-functional collaboration is not optimal Given your experience, and obviously you have a high culture that, that does promote that, it's just doing that all the time. What is the secret sauce here? What do you recommend looking at? When I think of culture, I actually have a different sort of, I think, lens and framework for thinking about it. I believe that great companies have a very specific brand. That brand is about the things that are super important and forever that are associated with that company. Part of being on brand within 90 is for everybody to be a culture carrier. We talk about core values. We hire first and foremost on core values. That's stuff you just can't teach. Part of our core values is team. And then there's a number of other core values that were all set up and put in place to ensure that we have a company where people are working up and down. I'm in a bunch of meetings every single week, specifically based upon what's going on. And you know, I'm this yuckity yuck CEO. And then we've got four layers below me and we have people from every single layer, a bunch of different departments. We're all in meetings all the time together. We're doing core value shout outs every single day on Slack. And just generally speaking, I think the people that we hire and retain course, promote, get it. They get what we're all about. They get that we're about building high trust relationships. And remember, it's not high trust relationships just with customers. It's with everyone. The organization is good at having people work with a bunch of different departments and a bunch of different stratums or levels of the organization. That's a huge thing. There's other things that we're super clear on. And I think if you get super clear on some of these 
forever things, your core values, your purpose, passion, just cause, or what I like to call the compelling why, if you get clear on your unique value propositions, you get really clear on what your ideal customer looks like and you help people understand there's a reason we have ideal customers because there's some customers that aren't ideal. With all due love and respect to the non-ideal customers, I'm not listening to you on purpose because we've got thousands and thousands of people talking to us. And, and in particular, if you're like a bad customer where you treat our employees like whatever, we don't want you with all due love and respect kind of a thing. Everybody in the company, one of our secret sauces is everybody cares. That genuinely care for all of our ideal stakeholders and they get the game we're playing. The reason we get very explicit about things that matter is so that we don't have to micromanage. And so they can go off and do their magic and lean into being great at what they want to be great at. And so we really drive hard to create a culture where people just genuinely love working with one another and understand that every single person in this company matters a lot. If you care about the company and you care about your colleagues and you care about the customers and you give them direction where direction is helpful, useful, it's not as hard as people make it out to be. Like you said, it all starts with intent having a vision of what kind of workplace you want to create. Mm -hmm. It's all starts from the head. And I think that's where your headspace is. And I love that you shared how you manifested that vision for how you wanted the organization that you were going to build out for 90 is going to look like. And I know there's a, there's even more stuff that you do. We're not going to expose all your secrets today. The one thing I will share though, if you get super clear on the things that matter and you're consistently talking about them, it reduces the friction within the organization a tremendous amount. And then ultimately the companies that we're building is a company that's going to be here beyond me. I think one of the big things that boards and CEOs don't do a very good job of is like making super clear what the soul of this company is all about. And don't mess with that. The next leader should not mess with that. And the board should not mess with that. Too often new CEOs come in and I'm like, well, I got to make my stamp. You know what? Everybody who's in this company, they came here because they believed in what we do. They believed in who we are. They believed in how we matter. They believed in the way we go about doing this stuff. And don't tear something down if you don't understand why it was built in the first place. Because you know what? You might not like what comes over the horizon. With that, Mark, it's a wrap. I appreciate you for taking the time to do this on my channel. I think it's always interesting to see how CEOs think about that, especially when you're in customer success, you have such hardcore beliefs. And sometimes even people get frustrated when they go from one organization to another, and all of a sudden CSM in one organization is very different than their job description in another, and they don't understand why these changes happen. They happen because the culture is different. They happen because the business model is different. And it happens because the customers are different. If I may add one more thing, it happens because the company's life cycle phase is different. What you're going to do as a CSM at a startup, like a very young emerging startup that's not even sure if it's a business, yes or no yet, is very different than a company that's about to go out to be an IPO or is public for many, many years. So take all of that into consideration. And I think you gave us a nice overview of how CEOs think about their customers, what's important for them, how do you perceive customer success and how it plays out, what's important for you when you think about customers, all about building trust. I really, really appreciate your perspective because we don't always get to see it on our channel, so in our podcast. So thank you so much, Mark. You're welcome. Great to be with you. If you enjoyed this episode, give this a like. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel. And if you want to hear more interviews with CEOs and other executives outside of CS, drop it in the comment below, ping them on my comments. I'd love to hear from you or reach out to me on LinkedIn and tell me what you want to hear next. And with that, it's a wrap. I'll see you on the next video. Mm -hmm.